Drumming. Hello, thanks for listening to the podcast Working Drummer. Today I talk to drummer Jerry Rowe. Widely known as a prolific and naturally gifted drummer, Jerry's list of artists he's performed and or recorded with is impressive. Just a few of these artists include Rodney Crowell, Emmy Lou Harris, Katie Lang, and Leland Sklar. Recently, Jerry's been concentrating most of his energy on his original band, Friendship Commanders. So this intro is just a bit longer than normal. Uh, I usually tell you about the uh, website and iTunes and our Twitter account. To give you a little bit more detail about that, uh, the website is workingdrummer.net. You can go there and check out uh, many of the other podcasts that we've done. We're almost up to 20 now. Um, You can also go to iTunes and you can write a review. We really appreciate your support uh, of this podcast. Uh, Again, we're almost up to 20 and the responses have been very good and very positive and it's, it's, uh, it's inspiring. We really appreciate that. Also, we have a Twitter account at working underscore drummer. Any questions or comments, you can find us at workingdrummer.net, and there's a place you can uh, write to us there. So again, uh, Mike and I appreciate all the support we've gotten so far. Uh, So without further ado, here is Jerry Rowe. I got called last minute for, it was a carnival demo, and they're like, we need you to come play, Fred's drums are here. You know, the snare drum stand here. I know. <laughs> it like hurt my back just to do it for ten seconds. <laughs> he does look that well, and that's what we, and we talked about that. And I said, um, the sound that's coming out is huge, yeah, and it's great. And like the live stuff that I saw him with um, Dixie Chicks, I was like, you were just rocking it, man. It wasn't like there's this little kit and this little sound. Yeah. There's like these hands, uh, almost like this Muppet thing, a la Cindy Blackman, just dash on car, tingle, and yeah. it was like, it was great. It was really cool. And uh, I mean, I sit high in my snare drum. I'm always trying to figure out where to put my snare drum and tilting and blah, blah, blah. I said, but it just, it looked really comfortable and really nice. It was fun. Yeah. He's like, ooh. No, it was it was cool. <laughs> he was cool. It was nice. But uh, I think we're good, man. I think this is working. But thank you. Hello. Thank you so much. Um, well, we both have little sleep, and I think we're going to be on the same level, man. This is good, because I would be embarrassed if you had, like, all the energy, and I was just blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's nice. Even keeled, laid back. Yeah. It's a nice day. Yeah. It's all good. So what, uh, what's going on, man? Well, uh, just in this band these days called Friendship Commanders and uh, doing studio work yeah, and being a married guy, having a nice time. Yeah. And um, yeah, I left the road as an employed hired gun about three months ago, I guess, now. So... Like a conscious decision, like this is it. It was a conscious decision because it was hard to leave the gig. It was wonderful, but yeah. Were you with Katie Lang? Uh, Emmy Lou Harris. Oh, okay. And okay. Rodney Crowell. Okay. Together, separately, and yeah. Okay. Did you work with Katie Lang? I oh. did, uh, in 2012. Okay. Was it that long ago? It was. I remember when Fred was doing that. He did it 2011, 2000, a little bit 2010 maybe okay played on the record and yeah 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 he went out and played with Cheryl Crow and I took over with KD I was living in LA at the time and I actually moved back here while on the gig okay so well what led to that man what led to the decision to I want to talk about working with Emmy Lou and all that stuff but what led to just being done with it all uh, well, I wouldn't say I'm done with it all. Uh, I take my band very seriously. Uh, it kind of slowly came together. I'm in a band with my wife, and um, this kind of slowly came together about two years ago, two and a half years ago, mm-hmm. when we decided to play some of her songs really loudly. <laughs> 
see what would happen. And she's a big fan of old 80s West Coast punk and punk rock and hardcore, post-punk, mm-hmm. all that stuff in general. She worked with Jay Robbins on her old band's records. And Who's Jay Robbins? Jay, sorry, Jay Robbins is the lead singer of, lead singer, primary songwriter, head of uh, Jawbox and Burning Airlines. And he's a okay. engineer and producer okay. work, working out of Baltimore. I'm not going to pretend I know. He's from I, I the DC know. scene. Okay. Uh, very influential 90s band in the, awesome. the post okay. punk, post hardcore scene. Okay. Um, and it just one thing led to another between me and Buick, and it became a thing, like a punk rock trio. It's kind of evolved more into just like a hard rock trio with punk and metal leanings, which is where we both are. Yeah. So I love it. And so I left the road to do that. And also, it, it was just time to not be playing other people's music on the road for a while. Yeah. If I'm going to be doing, you know, playing other people's songs, it's going to be in the studio. Yeah. Because that's going pretty well for me these days. So, yeah. Um, but you were living in LA. Um, and you moved here, you moved back to yeah. Nashville. You grew up in Nashville? Born and raised. Right. And so I moved out to L.A., how old would I have been? Seven years ago? Yeah. About? I don't think it was too terribly long ago. Yeah, not seven, not quite seven years ago, but... What was that like? What was the experience like moving out there? Or what was the decision that led up to that? And I'd always wanted to live out there because uh, I liked what went on there musically. Yeah. I prefer it culturally and socially, mm-hmm. and I prefer the weather, of course, the yeah. food. <laughs> and so I finally did it. The irony is that I met the woman that I ended up marrying, who lived here six months before I moved. <laughs> and we were together the whole time, Yeah. and eventually got married, and she was going to move out there, but just about everything went wrong to keep that from happening. Mm. So I got the gig with Katie and decided to move back. A lot of people were like, you got tired of L.A. or you hated it. I actually loved it, and I was doing really well um, yeah. around the time I decided to move back. I moved back here for my marriage and yeah. to be here, and it's ended up working out. The town's changed enough since I left and came back. Yeah, yeah. That um, I Also, I just needed to leave. My, my family was here three right. generations deep, mm-hmm. and it was time to escape that for a while. Yeah. I think sometimes uh, when you are growing and you get to a point in your life and you're like, it's not really where I'm going. I just need to get away from where I grew up. Yeah. If that makes sense, because I remember leaving Columbus. Um, it wasn't about me moving to Nashville. It was about me leaving home, right. leaving the comforts of that. I mean, I didn't want to leave my friends and all those things, but I needed to just experience something new. It was really good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, un- it, I wouldn't say it's unusual or it's becoming less unusual, but um, there's a common saying that there aren't too many native Nashvilleans. Everyone's from someplace else. And you're one of the few musicians that I know that grew up here. Yeah. There are a few of us. And in fact, I played a show a couple of weeks ago where there were four of us on stage at once. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know that it's ever happened before. But yeah, it was pretty funny. Yeah. We're all the same age, pretty much, too. So, <laughs> I have a feeling that's going to be a thing. Yeah. Um, we just went to the Country Music Hall of Fame today for my 10-year-old's field trip, and all the kids submitted uh, lyrics to songs that they wrote. Mm-hmm. And a songwriter was there at the end of the tour and put music to some of the lyrics. And I thought, it was, it was cool. It was a neat idea. So he picked about six songs uh, from the kids and, and wrote the music and, and performed them. And I'm thinking, okay, here's these 10-year-olds that are, it's just nothing to them. It's, it's pretty common. Uh, myself and another parent were in the music business. And so as we're walking around, we're talking. Some of the other parents were asking us supplemental questions about, so what is going on with so-and-so? Or what happened when this record came out? Or what can, you know, so it's kind of funny that I think there's this generation, the kids are there. But just today, I, I'm just realizing that they're, this is normal for them. You know what I mean? Just yeah. to be around the music, you know, all that stuff. But speaking of normal and being around music, can you talk about your family? Talk about, and I have a picture of your grandfather I took at the Country Music Hall of Fame. Oh, wow. <laughs> today. 
I saw it. Uh, they had the Smokey and the Bandit 2 Trans Am there. Oh, yes. It's, uh, it's on display now. Yes. All right. And your grandfather's hanging out, and I was like, I, that's funny. I'm going to see him today, and I'll, I'll take a picture. <laughs> yeah. Um, my, my, uh, my grandfather was Jerry Reed, the country singer, songwriter, guitarist, and actor. Yeah. Most known for Smoking the Bandit and the songs he's bounding down when you're hot, you're hot. Name is Moses. Um, and he, of course, his story goes back a long time. Three failed record deals that eventually culminating in one very successful one. Um, and my dad is Dave Rowe, who's a bassist, um, not the son of Jerry Reed. Uh, he married Jerry Reed's daughter, my mother. Mm-hmm. His story is he grew up in Hawaii in the the funk fusion jazz scene playing electric bass which is funny because now he's most known for playing upright he played with johnny cash for 20 years but um he moved here and one of the first road gigs he ever got was with jerry reed my grandfather and that's how he met my mother yeah and there starts the me getting it from all sides and the music right business pretty much what was that like i mean growing up in that house or or did you see your grandfather very much oh i knew him very well yeah i knew him uh Spent all holidays over at the house and hung out with him all the time. Was it expected that you were going to be involved in music, or did it just happen? Well, I've played drums since I was one and a half. Okay. <laughs> I think you win. Yeah, largely because of my grandfather and my father. My, uh, my grandfather was the one who said I should be a drummer. He thought I had innate rhythm. And also, he loved drums. He was a frustrated drummer. He he uh, always wished he was one. Okay. He discovered Larry London. and Yeah, right and all that and so yeah i i actually literally have no idea what made me want to play music because i just always have been playing music yeah that's it but you're also not a drummer you're also a bass player yeah and guitarist so yeah yeah, it's just it's interesting i I say hear that question asked a lot and i i will never be able to properly answer that and i know it keeps me enjoying music somebody told you when you started playing drums yeah. Because... I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't remember. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I, have a, I have a scar from when I fell and got stitches on my face, and I, I have no recollection of it because I was so young that uh, I have to ask about the story. So you're probably at an age where, like, when did I start, when did I start doing this? You yeah. have to be told because you were so I started playing drums so young that, you know, most people when they're young, they can't reach the kick pedal on an adult kit. I couldn't reach the kick pedal on a child's kit. That's <laughs> how young I was. So that's weird. But yeah. I started so young. How young? Yeah. Uh, what about um, other instruments? I mean, was it, you started drums, did you... Were, were you working uh, on developing, you know, skills with other instruments, or was it that that just come naturally? Uh, I guess it kind of came naturally just through fiddling around, since uh, all of the instruments were just around in the house. Yeah, and my father always had a recording studio set up. Oh, cool! In one room somewhere in the house. Yeah. And when my parents split up, I still had a recording studio set up. He made sure I had that. He thought it was very important. And. There were, again, always instruments around. So I would just, you know, make my own songs with bass, guitar, and drums. And yeah. uh, the bass thing actually became a very serious interest. I think that's why I brought it up. I mean, I can yeah. only assume that you've kind of got your hands on different instruments. And uh, I just the, what I know about you, man, you're just a, you're an extremely musical drummer. Oh, thank you. So knowing that when I f- saw you play bass... Uh, not, you know, knowing that you played bass, but then seeing you play and hearing you play. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Of course he plays bass. So if you play other things, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, you know, I guess just having it around. Um, but bass really connected with me. It's what I listen to the the most in records anymore, actually. Hmm. Um, and it just it was needed when I was around. Which is was also the that's the story of my dad. My dad was initially a drummer, and he ordered a drum kit from the music store because they didn't have one. And there was a big shortage of bass players in Hawaii. So when he went to pick up his drum kit, when it showed up, he saw a J bass on the wall and said, "I'm just going to buy that instead." <laughs> the store when the drum was, sets, yeah, the store owner was so pissed. And <laughs> that's that's awesome, man. But yeah, you know, I just, it, it became a real interest, I guess, in my late teens. Yeah. Um. 
and I started really wanting to do it. And then one night on Lower Broadway in Nashville, I was playing with a rockabilly trio, and no one was there, and we'd had a few drinks, and we're like, what if we just switch instruments? So I started playing bass, and somebody came in, I forget who it was, and saw me playing bass and asked if I could do a gig in three days with them. <laughs> and the bass player laughed really hard and was like, I want to see it, I'm going to let you borrow my rig. And yeah, ever since, it's been like, Oh, this is something I can do. I I sucked in the gig, faked my way through it, yeah. and I guess they thought I did all right because I played with them a few more times. Yeah. <laughs> you know, man, I I kind of wonder about that. Maybe you can help me understand this because I uh, I love playing drums so much, and there's something about drums that the physical connection with music, you know, not only just the audible part of it that I just wonder if other instrumentalists get that, or other musicians, I should say, get that same kind of feedback, that same high that you get when you're, when you're playing, when you're just... Um, and I know it's different, so maybe you can help me, because I know uh, just, well, I guess just playing bass, you know, I mean, just how does that... You obviously wanted to do more of it after you did those gigs and pursue it more. Yeah, well, you know... There's a lot of pressure on the drummer because you're the f- you're keeping things glued together. Yeah, in a way, like the 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 vocalist's time, the bass player's time, the guitarist's time, the keyboardist's time is all kind of coming at you in a way that you have to interpret and make sense of mm-hmm. for everybody else to stick together. Mm-hmm. For the most part, I feel like when you're playing with a folk artist or an Americana artist, almost always they're the timekeeper and you're kind of floating with them. Yeah. That's my experience. But there's that with drums. And with bass, there's definitely a lot riding on you because you're playing one low note that if it's wrong at all is is like can be fatal. That was always my my understanding. It just seemed like bass is there is a lot of pressure on bass because yeah. when he makes one wrong note, it makes everyone sound like they're playing the wrong chord. Yeah. Um but What's interesting is, whereas on drums, you know, you'd hit, like, a kick drum, and then you'd have the snare drum one beat later, and in between that the time that you hit that first kick drum beat and the next kick drum beat, there's going to be four hi-hat hit, hits, Yeah, and that just continues and continues, say you're just playing a straight eights feel, yeah. and within all that time, you're just playing one note on bass, it's just floating out there, and... I find I can't it's a it's an equally spiritual experience that is more floaty and free and there's a lot more freedom to it I feel yeah, like I in that. that way so it's just a totally different experience I you know I've never really thought about it until you brought it up I'm sorry but, if I ruined it for you no no I, I mean it's <laughs> it's great I, I think and I mentioned this in uh, another podcast with Steve E.B. Uh, when I had a chance to sit in with the long players and play percussion. And I enjoyed it so much, just not having the responsibility of playing drum set, uh, to have the tempo ready to go, the count in, and bring everybody in. And I just could float along, I guess, like you say. And, oh, here comes the tambourine part on this. And then, Calvo, you know, we're doing um, Rubber Soul. And I just, I had a blast. I felt a weight lifted because I wasn't carrying the responsibility of drums. Yeah. Of drum set. That being said, uh, and I play guitar and I play keyboards and stuff like that, but I, I mean, I, I just love playing drums so much Yeah. that uh, I just wonder if anyone else in the band knew how fun it was uh, that they would stop doing what they were doing. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I don't know. It's funny. I I see all all sides of it. Um, I but, played I played guitar on gigs, and that's really nerve wracking. I'm still kind of a nervous wreck. Yeah. Whenever that's happening. Yeah. Um, because that's a very showy instrument, and there's a lot of vanity involved. And I don't say that in an insulting manner, because there's vanity involved in everything. But there's definitely like, it's it's like being a lead vocalist in a way. Oh yeah. So. Yeah, I don't know. Bass and drums, I really have a very deep connection with in that way. Sure, sure. Man, can you talk a little bit more about, um, if you don't mind, um, what it was like uh, being raised in the unique situation you were? I mean, I think people were would be very interested in 
kind of what it was like? Uh, well, maybe just you know, briefly. I mean, my my dad's influence musically was very important. Uh, I didn't really search for a lot of music because it was given to me. Because I also had a dad who was pretty hip. Um, like he brought home Pantera records for me to listen to because he thought the drumming was great and it was yeah. something I should hear. Got me really into Bill Bruford with Red, King Crimson, and nice. Elvis Costello. Because um, the great thing about him is he was also a songwriter and he was very concerned about great songwriting and yeah. lyrics and all of that. So I had a very well-rounded um, introduction to music from him. Mm-hmm. My grandfather was, he was a granddad. He was on the on the like outskirts circling and just being the loving grandfather. And, you know, he was kind of a heavy distant celebrity type. So I never really got too close to him. Like I I would probably like a normal grandfather. I I don't know what's to say. I loved him very much and I understood it. Yeah. So he was just very positive and thought it was great that I was playing music. That's great. Yeah. There was never any doubt. It seemed that I was going to have a career. Yeah. From anyone. And I think that led me to be able to have a career because I also didn't have any doubts. You know, yeah. I believed it and it came. Um, and I think that's interesting that, that, to make that distinction about your upbringing compared to a lot of other people's is that oftentimes we have to wrestle with our own self doubt in this uh, unusual, uh, untraditional vocation. Mm hmm. And we have parents, uh, an older generation, who are concerned about this non-traditional vocation as well. Yeah. You know, and, you know, parents, they want the best for us. And music is not always the wisest choice, or the entertainment business isn't always the wisest choice uh, as far as a solid foundational career. And when you're passionate about it, and your parents just don't understand um, your passion for it, then that disconnect happens. But in your case, you have two generations before you that that's all they, that's what they know. Yeah. You know? Um, and so I like the fact that you, you're like, there was no doubt. Right. This is what I was going to do. I also think uh, I was very lucky to be in sort of the the last generation, probably. I, I don't know. It's probably still happening a little bit, but underage laws weren't so strict yet. So mm. I could go into a bar and watch my dad play a set and hang around, hang out with his buddies who would make sure I was okay. Yeah, yeah. And it was a totally positive experience. Um and also kind of gave me some street smarts. So I, I grew up going to gigs he was playing and sitting in and being around that. And now nowadays it just doesn't happen. They won't let you in. And But there's no smoking. There's no smoking, at least. <laughs> but, but now there's guns allowed. Yeah. Well. Kids, kids, are, kids today are sort of deprived of that experience, I think. Yeah. Um, and I can't say that it's a wrong decision because uh, alcoholism is bad and drunk people are not a great thing to be around when you're yeah. young. And so, no. you know, there there was that. Right. But um, that was that was pretty wonderful. Like, that was a pretty wonderful learning experience. I really knew how to be an adult because I was around that. Yeah. Being treated like an adult in an adult situation as sure. a child. I took two private lessons. Okay. And I was in school band. That was in, last week. Right. <laughs> I was in school band in fifth grade in which I actually played upright bass. That's when that started. Okay. Um, and I'm an eighth grade dropout, so it didn't actually go farther than that. Okay. <laughs> That's the extent of my wow my, okay. stu- my okay. studies besides just playing along to records. And- yeah. So that that's that's where you self-taught, essentially. Yes. Okay. All right. Um so after that, uh, growing up in Nashville, what was like the first, did you ever work in any other capacity or was it always music? I worked at an electronic store for six months when I was 15. Mm-hmm. Um, and from 16 to like right when I was 18, I worked at a video game store. And kept the job longer than I needed it, so I would just get the, the discount. <laughs> and I actually kind of liked the job in a yeah, weird way. Yeah, sure. Um, but when I was 
when I was 18, I got the gig with Gretchen Wilson and had to quit. Yeah. And ever since then. Wow. Um, and I moved out right like two weeks before I turned 18, primarily making a living playing on lower Broadway. Yeah. So yeah, ever since the age of 18, pretty much is all I've done. Um, lower Broadway, uh, the most of the times I'd seen you, you were at Roberts. Yeah. Or bluegrass Inn. Right. So when you were playing down there, and I know your father plays upright the times that I've seen him down there. Does he only play upright now? Oh, no. He's he's a great okay. electric player. Okay. He just uprights what he became known for because of the whole slap thing and Johnny sure, Cash. Sure, sure. And so when the times that I, I had seen you down there, uh, that was what you were doing. Was mm-hmm. that primarily the kind of music that you were playing when you were down there? Yeah, I was blessed to really only play traditional country music or rock and roll or rockabilly Mm -hmm. or blues of that sort. I Mm -hmm. never really played any top 40 cover gigs. I've played like maybe eight in my life. Yeah. And most of those were actually just because they were pals that were in need. Mm -hmm. Or I was playing bass and I always jump with a chance to play bass. Sure, sure. Um, Otherwise, it was just classic country or anything like that. Yeah. That's where my vocabulary is and that stuff anyway, uh, you right. know, so. But the I think that, um, I, I mean, I knew you um, just briefly a short time before uh, you got the Gretchen Wilson gig. And I knew the times that I had seen you, you were doing a lot of the rockabilly and the tra- yeah. traditional country. But the Gretchen Wilson gig was heavy. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, was there anything different about that than when you got into the gig? This is like, I have. I have to change this. I have to get different sticks. I well, to, whatever. The other side of this is that I'm really a metalhead, and I've always been, like yeah, the Pantera Pan- records. Pantera gotcha. records. Uh, the classic country was like osmosis. It was just around me. And, right, that makes and sense. Sure. I grew up with it, and I knew it, and of course, I loved it. It was in my blood. Yeah. So I knew how to do it, but you know, I I practiced the prog rock and metal mm-hmm. and like grunge and hard rock. Mm-hmm. Matt Cameron's maybe. Mm. If you had to. Make me pick like an all time most influential important guy. Yeah. Or a record I played along to more than anything. It'd be Matt Cameron and Bill Bruford, pretty much. Oh wow. Yeah. So hitting hard and yeah. Doing the showy thing yeah. was not anything that I was okay. was, that was foreign to me. Right. And all my original bands up to that point had been some form of rock, hard rock or mm-hmm. metal leaning music. Mm-hmm. So it um So it's almost full circle here. Right. Maybe what you're doing now. Yeah. Um, what's funny is there, are, you know, not to say anything too controversial, modern country likes to think it rocks. And when it says to rock or do something like this music, and then you do it, they think you're doing it wrong, but you're actually doing it right. And that's not what they actually want. They just want Def Leppard or something. Yeah. So <laughs> that's... <laughs> That was a little weird. The kind of the the culture the cultural thing. I didn't last long in the Gretchen gig. I, I got the gig immediately. <laughs> I didn't necessarily respect the situation, so I I dyed my hair orange, started spiking it up. They made me get a hat. I got a gigantic white cowboy hat and started acting like an idiot on stage. <laughs> it was kind of a party vibe, and I was straight edge at the time, pretty much. And so that yeah, I got fired pretty quick. Okay. The, only, the only job I've ever been fired from in my entire life. Okay. Uh, well, you know, that's you can put that on your resume. Right. I was fired from Gretchen Fired Wilson. from the Gretchen Wilson gig. <laughs> Interesting. I like that. Yeah. You know, it's but it is funny that I've had friends that have gotten fired from gigs, and I learned pretty quickly that it's no reflection on on you as a player at all no or as or, a person or as a, or as a per, right or as a person i mean there's so many other elements mm-hmm. that come into play to someone holding on to a gig or losing a gig that um people think oh i lost this gig what are people going to think of me as a musician or maybe my abilities and it's like no no people that know that that's that has nothing to do with it there's so many other factors to it yeah you know, for sure for sure. I think I gained a little bit of respect for you, actually, when you lost that gig. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, what's great, too, is... Or a little bit more, I should say. <laughs> B- Billy Block, God rest his soul. Yeah. Um, he, uh, I told, I said to him and a couple other people that I lost the gig because I, I took a crap in the tour bus bathroom <laughs> and it flooded into her bunk. 
And Billy ran with that rumor and told everybody that, and it was <laughs> awesome that that happened. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah, but uh, in actuality, from what I understood, they the the wonderful irony of what I was saying about them not really getting it is they thought I was kind of puny, I guess, and didn't rock enough. So I got fired from the gig, and then a week later went out on the road with the legendary Shack Shakers, who are a psychobilly gypsy punk rock band. Yeah. Like that have fans and Jello be offer and everything and did that for a while. Yeah. So, <laughs> joke was on them, really. I guess. I guess. So. Um. So how long did you do that, man? That was a wonderful like year, six yeah. months to a year. Mm-hmm. Went overseas. Um. I lost like twenty pounds because we were playing so fast. It you was didn't like have the, twenty pounds to lose. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. No. But. uh we were playing. He, he uh, the lead singer of the band, told me start the first song of the set as fast as you can play it, and I would, and then he would turn around and tell me to speed up, <laughs> and so that was that was it. They were great shows, punk rock shows. Uh, JD is such a great front man. The music's really great and fun, and that was the kind of experience I should have been having at that age. It was a real learning experience, down and dirty in a van, and yeah, being yeah. in more of a band vibe. Well, how long was the Gretchen Wilson gig? That was like three months for me. Yeah. I went overseas for the first time on that gig. When the Gretchen Wilson thing? Yeah. Okay. And uh, did three months. So, yeah, three months. Yeah. Cool. Move on. Yeah. I played for the number two selling Billboard artist at the time on the top 200. Yeah. It was right, right when Redneck Woman was out. Right, right, right. Um, and I will say to this, when I got uh, fired from the gig, I came home to see the band that i had quit so i could be on the gig play a show and it was a horrible feeling and i'd kind of taken that gig caving into the pressures of being a well-to-do money earning hired gun musician when really all i wanted was to be a like a rock band guy Mm -hmm. and i kind of abandoned that and i have to beg anyone who's a musician to go after that first before you go after the easy money Mm -hmm. because when you're young is when you can do it yeah You'll end up regretting it if you don't. Right, right. Luckily, I only had a three-month window of not doing it. Yeah. And That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But once you were there, and you had the bus, and you had the money, and you had the women, no, you <laughs> had all this, <laughs> and you had the sugar. Yeah. Um, it didn't let you, it didn't let it, you didn't let it change your personality. No. Yeah. Because I like playing music that I like a lot. Right. Primarily. Sure. That's awesome. Um, so for your legendary Shack Shakers, did you say you went overseas with that? We did. Uh, Norway, you know, all of Scandinavia, Germany, UK. For a while, we were over there for a month. Wow. They like it heavy, don't they? Yeah. Man. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you were back in Nashville... After that? Yeah, after that, I actually left that gig because the band that I was in before mm-hmm. asked, had asked me back and turned into something else, and we went on the road with that band for a while. And what was that? It was called Keating. Uh, ended up changing its name to Paper Rival, uh, and I ended up splitting. The bands turned into something that I didn't really want to be a part of, and they got signed to Atlantic and gave it a go. And mm-hmm. It's a good band. We uh, they made a record called Dialogue that I played on one song on called uh, Keep Us In. Mm. And I'm pretty proud of it. It's a cool record. Yeah. And uh yeah, that 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 kind of fell apart and I went out on the road with uh the Wreckers, Michelle Branch and right, Jessica Hart. Right. Yeah. Which is where I first met Fred Eltringham. Yeah. Cuz he was wrapping up Dixie Chicks and was just moving to town. Mhm. So when I I ended up leaving that gig to join a band called Head Automatica, it was on Warner Brothers, hmm. that I had met while on tour with my old band Keating. Um, and Fred joined that gig. Fred joined, joined the records, records. The records, mm-hmm. and uh, so I did that for about a year until the the label pulled the plug. The band kind of started, yeah, slowly dissolving. They spent a lot of money on the record, and it didn't take off, and. Then Fred left the records, and I went back to the records. Okay. <laughs> I remember you were in the, you were in the video. I remember the right. single that they put out. Uh, my oh my, yeah. And you had a cowboy hat. I had on. a cowboy hat on. I was on a horse. 
I got yeah. the only one with a broken saddle, and I'd never been on a horse before, so that was weird. How can yeah. you be Jerry Reed's grandson and never have been on a horse? I'm not very country, man. You know, yes, that's... listen to my weird Maine-esque accent that <laughs> I have. Native, yep, that's native true. Tennessean. I was in a band with Matthew Hungate, son of David Hungate, the bass player for Toto. Yeah. Ernest Chapman, son of Beth Nielsen Chapman, singer-songwriter, who wrote This Kiss by Faith Hill and had her own career. Jackson O'Brien, Tim O'Brien's son, the bluegrass musician, mm-hmm. Hot Rise, and, mm-hmm. you know, the old boys, all that. Um, that was my childhood band. And Ernest had found an investor to make his solo record, finally, and was going out to L.A. to do it with Matt Rawlings and oh. really wanted me to play on it. Yeah. And... I had gotten some free tickets to L.A., so I was like, hey, just let me fly out and play on a couple songs, and if it works out, you know, I'd love to play on it. And it yeah. did. I ended up playing on it, met a bunch of people that kind of facilitated my move out there. Yeah. Uh, ended up working with Leland Sklar. Yeah, I wanted Tim to ask Pierce, about that. A bunch of people. I had yeah. a great time. What was it like working with Lee? Lee's the sweetest man with the most amazing, vulgar sense of humor that you'll you'll ever know uh and of course an amazing bass player right then there's that (laughs) yeah really like really wonderful free pocket and uh the first thing i ever did with him actually was a soundtrack for a porno mockumentary that matt (laughs) rawlings had written and so we were playing porn grooves while listening to all this like ridiculous dialogue (laughs) and it was a pretty great experience for meeting such a heavy like that yeah at that time, definitely the heaviest cat I'd ever worked with. Yeah. So? I mean, it, it, your father being a bass player, you being a bass player, I mean, did you feel, I mean, was there nerves involved in this interaction? Well, there were some nerves, but again, the ridiculousness of the situation definitely tamed it a bit. I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> that probably helped. And Matt's so great to work with. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and that led to a friendship. I worked with Leland for a little while. He actually was a big part of me playing with Jostle, which is that all bass player band with with Jonas Helborg and Steve Bailey. Wow, they have wow. In which Lee's basically the bass player. Everybody else is okay. Lead guitar on a bass. Wow. Did yeah. you guys do a uh, big bottom? We did not. We should have. Uh, did you have a band out there when you were in LA? I was in a band called Useless Keys for a while. Yeah. Uh, it was like shoegaze, grunge, doom metal. Sludge, yeah. kind of. And, uh... What was different? I mean, what what do you... Was there anything, like, significantly different that surprised you when you were in L.A. compared to your experience here in Nashville? Well, some people are going to get, disagree with me and call me crazy. Now, this is this related to what you're going to... To the question, or are you just... Is that a blanket statement? It, uh, probably a blanket <laughs> statement. But also, um, L.A. pointed out to me how kind of shallow and really competitive Nashville is as far as a local rock scene is concerned and even among players mm-hmm. which is funny because I feel like that's all people say LA is like here right. but in LA all I experienced was a really supportive brotherly music scene interesting venues that would give bands a chance and would yeah. book them regularly and the same people would come see us every time we played unless they couldn't including your peers and coworkers and people you were technically in competition with yeah yeah they supported you they you know play shows with you Mm -hmm. and there was a big community like it you know if you look up la weekly and just go on like the mobile thing on your phone music listings for tonight it's 15 pages long every night yeah and there's a there are at least four or five things that are worth seeing wow so i really enjoyed being in a band out there yeah there's a live band community that doesn't really exist here Being in an original project isn't so celebrated or supported, uh, which is sad. But it's 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 a music business community. It's not really a music community. I think that's what that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, If you come from another town where musicians are kind of banding together to find a place to create uh, their support, yeah, invariably in a town like Nashville, it is not music city as much as it is music business yeah. city right and I'm, i don't say that disparagingly i don't i don't say that with a chip on no my it is what it is it's right. just what it is you know yeah. getting people to come see you play music is nigh impossible 
And I can't say I blame them because almost everyone does it for their, for a living, you know? Yeah. But, but but you were saying that in L.A., your peers were there supporting you. Yeah. As, if they're doing it the same way you're doing it. Yeah. as Because it, it was my art form and it's something that I care about. You yeah. don't start an original project just because you're bored. You know? <laughs> it's, it, you know, it means something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, were you able to make a living out there when you were working? I was. Uh, I had a scary year of no touring. Uh, my first two years out there were spent touring. Well, the first year and a half were spent touring. And then um, the like second full year I was there, I took off from the road and mm-hmm. nearly went broke. But it picked up and started doing well, and that culminated in me getting the KD line gig. Yeah. Yeah, but during that year of not touring, was that mostly session work, or were you doing the original thing? Or session work. There's a lot of learning original sets out there mm-hmm. for like 150 a pop, like one rehearsal, mm-hmm. play a gig. Mm-hmm. You can do two of those a day sometimes. Play mm-hmm. in hotel cafe or mm-hmm. lots of places like that. Um, a lot of weird gigs for people who have lots of money that invest and just mm-hmm. have a project, which happens here, but it has its own flavor out there with like dance and performance coaches and interesting backing tracks techno and dancers and like gonna shows. say what kind of music what kind of drumming were you doing out there uh a lot well a lot of singer songwriter stuff uh some rock stuff uh the funny thing is my first really big master session a record that charted was actually a pop country record that i did <laughs> out in la with scotty mccreary i love you this big yeah and that was on his first record it was an american idol session yeah um, but otherwise, it was a lot of did some jazz. Oh, cool! I played with some some uh, kind of guitar shredders, their original projects, mm. semi regularly. Did some shows at MI for that. Oh, neat! Interesting. Yeah. Um, did you uh, start working? Uh, did you start using Graviato when you were out there, or were you using? I mean, not getting yes. into the gear thing, but I seem to remember when you were living out in LA, all of a sudden you were posting these pictures of those beautiful kits. And I was like, yeah, wow. I ordered my first, uh, Craviato kit. Was it 2008? Uh, no, 2009, 2009. Yeah. I was a Mapex artist up until, uh, the end of 2009 when I ordered my first Craviato kit and joined the family. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, And what made the, what, what was the reason for the transition there or, I played a kit and that was it. <laughs> I, and then I saw a bunch of other ones and uh you know I there are some great drums out there today but all the big drum companies tend to kind of feel the same their drums to me. Mm-hmm. They're very there is a limit on the dynamic range you have with them. You can only go so quiet, you can only go so loud. Right. And you can get some different wood combinations and they're all finished out differently, but right. it just feels like you're getting the same thing no matter what, mm-hmm. pretty much. Mm-hmm. And I knew I wasn't getting that with Craviato drums. They're all made to order. They're all single ply. They resonate like crazy, even if you're plowing into them as hard as you can. Right, right, right. And it's all I can play at this point from the way they feel. Yeah. Same thing with minor cymbals. I've just gotten used to the way they feel and sound. Mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm such a fanboy. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, it's kind of a no-brainer. I, it, I mean, it was expensive. Yeah, yeah. Spent more than a third of my income. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when you got engaged, you're like, "Honey, I'm sorry, I already spent my right. money." Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Dude, she understands. We're in a band together. You know, <laughs> she plays '69 SG. Oh wow, okay. gear's not cheap. <laughs> yeah. Um. That's where we're recording at the homeless shelter right now. Um, but you've got your own little corner here. It's right. really awesome, man. Yeah. Sweet, sweet. Um, I was looking at your uh, website, and uh, I was looking at some of the projects that you had. And uh, there was one, uh, or you could probably just tell me about it, um, the singer from uh, Toe the Wet Sprocket. Yeah. And um, oh, who, who all is in that band? What that Because the reason... I, uh, one of the reasons I noticed that is uh, actually a, a guy that I work with, a uh, fiddle player that I work with, uh, totally loves the group. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I heard this stuff. And just he's just like, this is the coolest thing. He's a Toad the White Sprocket fan, and um, he plays mandolin. 
on that group. Uh, or um, uh, Walker Steely, Nickel Creek. Yes, Nickel from Nickel, yeah, Nickel and it's, Creek. And it's uh, Sean Watkins is in WPA. Okay. The guitar player from Nickel Creek. Okay. Uh, that, that project started as one thing entirely uh, and ended up as a whole different thing. Um, Luke Bula, a uh, violinist and singer-songwriter, was in that band, and I actually remembered him playing it for me when I still lived in Nashville. Mm-hmm. I moved out there, and the WPA lineup was initially Glenn Phillips from Toad Sprocket, Sean Watkins from Nickel Creek, Sarah Watkins from Nickel Creek, mm-hmm. Ben Montench. Oh, cool. Pete Thomas, Davey Farager, mm-hmm. Luke Bulla, and Greg Lease. Uh, so for startup band, that was impossible. They could not tour with that ever. And <laughs> Right, right, right. And uh, Pete was really busy, and Pete Thomas is one of my all-time favorites, so it was really weird to be... Re- Pete Thomas like, with Elvis Yeah, from Costello. Elvis Costello and mm-hmm. the Attractions. So it was really kind of weird to be filling in for him, which ended up being replacing him. Jeez. Um, so we did that project. Luke eventually went on to do his own thing, um, and the core of the project became me, Glenn... Sean Watkins and Sebastian Steinberg, the bass player from Soul Coughing. Okay. Which was also weird because I was a huge fan of Soul Coughing growing up. Those <laughs> those records were amazing. Yeah. Such great groove stuff. Yeah. And so I was in a band with two guys that were on the the radio when I was younger that I was, you know, yeah. a big fan of. And yeah. Sean, who was more of a contemporary, closer to my age group and sure. They just became my best friends. And nice. we toured for a, about a year doing that. Uh, ended up making like a four song EP. Say the name of the of the group again. WPA Works Progress Administration. Okay. And uh, I'm not on the initial record that came out. That's the original lineup. But we did a four song EP called Four by Four that I actually mixed, mm-hmm. and it was fun. I wish we could do that again, but it it um everybody's you know Toad's back together, Nickel Creek's back right. together, Sebastian's been out with Fiona and Blake Mills and doing a lot of other stuff. Yeah. So Fiona Apple, that is. Sorry. I'm in a great situation here in Nashville, and uh, I would I would probably at the end of the day prefer to live out on the West Coast somewhere just because I love it so much. Yeah. But you know, I really like making music here. Yeah. I really like the people in my generation that are coming up and becoming really successful session musicians. Yeah. It's fun to play with them, and it's fun to like see it happen and be a part of it. Right. It really means a lot to me. Right. Um. So I'm happy here. Yeah. You know. Uh, California is in a weird situation with the drought and yeah, um, it really does actually seem like the music business is almost moving here entirely, mm-hmm. uh, which people have been saying has been happening for a long time, but it actually hasn't until about the past two or three years. It has. Yeah. It yeah. seems like the last three years, it's been really crazy. Yeah. So I don't know. I just, it's, this is the place to be right now for right. what we're doing. I would love to live somewhere where, you know, my original projects would would be a part of a more vibrant local music scene. Yeah. But, you know, it's kind of, we're, we're so centrally located, we can go anywhere. So with an original project in a scene like Nashville, how do you make it work? What is the, what are you guys doing to kind of further the progress of the, of the band? I mean, uh, well, we have been getting a pretty good fan base in town, been playing smartly, mm -hmm. playing less, uh, the last two years have been kind of a developmental stage where we've even really figured out what we are. Yeah. We just finished our uh, first LP. It's probably going to come out early next year. Okay. And um, the plan is to tour like crazy starting next year. And do you guys, or do you have any label support or anything like that? Or? That's that's all on the table and speculative, and I yeah. don't want to talk about it. Okay. Because <laughs> I don't want to jinx it. Sure. But... We're feeling pretty positive in life. Sure. And we really love what we're doing and believe in it 100%. Right. Which, right. Uh, this is the first project that I've really done uh, from the ground up where money hasn't really at all ever been a driving force. Yeah. We need it so we can live and have it be the only thing that we're doing. Right. You know what I mean? Right. But that's not what I'm in it for. Yeah. And there's something special about that. Yeah. Right. What does your, so I know that you're doing other work as far as session work and different things like that. What about your wife? 
She mm-hmm. is she's working as a musician. Uh, she writes music for campaign videos and advertisements. Mm. Wow. Uh, she's just a songwriter in general and works yeah. as a singer sometimes, background singer. Cool. And uh, she's a great recorder. Like she's a great engineer. Uh, she mixed our last three song three sided single that we put out. Yeah. So yeah. That's awesome. How do you spend your time like between shows and sessions are you practicing very much are you playing um i don't practice at all and i really need to uh (laughs) i'm actually playing on a metal record in early july that's got a lot of double pedal and yeah i I, i'm gonna have to work up to that again because if you don't play that 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 just goes away falls out from under you right um but most weeks i'm i'm tracking in the studio every day so i don't tend to want to play in my free time unless it's for the band right. to try and stay in love with my instrument yeah uh, i am a video game fan i'm a movie fanatic yeah i like reading old crime novels i'm a big jim thompson fan and yeah. people like that yeah well and, and i think for people that maybe don't know you um your hands are awesome man I mean, the times I've seen you play, your hands are just, I'm just like, man, your facility is incredible. So uh, when you say you don't practice, uh, I'm not thinking, oh, well, you probably should. (laughs) You know, I'm thinking, oh. Well, I should, you know. That's cool. Because I like video games too, but I sit down like maybe once a month and spend, you know, a couple hours and I'm like, okay, I got to go do something else. Right. I just don't have the time, you know, uh, to do it. I wish I could, but I am one of those players that has to practice and play constantly just to maintain just some sort of level facility. Um, but, uh, I don't know, man, you, you remind me of a couple other players that I know that, um, you just, you have this natural musicianship about your playing and, uh, and this facility that, when you say, oh, I really don't practice it, you, I, I'm kind of not surprised. Uh, <laughs> you know you. what I mean? Uh, yeah. it, it, I think depends on, I don't know where that comes from. Um, if it comes from just having grown up playing music, hearing music, you know, that balance between everything, uh, connecting the dots between what you've been listening to all your life and what you've been physically doing all your life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I think a lot of times we those things uh, are separate. As musicians, we forget not to, you know, we forget to listen more and we're spending all this time, especially, I guess, drummers, for example, working on these patterns or this out of this book or, you know, whatever the teachers handed you and different things like that. And I think that um, sometimes those things can be a good tool to get you to a certain place. But if we forget music is what we're trying to do, that... yeah. And, you know, I was actually having this conversation earlier today. Um, It's hard. I've only really ever started thinking of myself as a drummer recently. And I've never really thought about thinking of myself as anything. Mm -hmm. I've just always been just a musician. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't enjoy playing gigs because I get to play fun, stupid stuff on the drums. Mm -hmm. Like whether or not I get to bash away and play fast and play a really fun pattern mm-hmm. isn't, isn't important to me if the song sucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather play a great song, which I'm doing barely anything. Yeah. Uh, I love playing crazy fast stuff. That's an important distinction. I mean, just, yeah, I want to, I want to make sure that, I mean, I understand exactly what you're saying. The song first. Right. And, and there are people who do love just being able to play fun stuff on the drums. And that's what gets them off. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I I only like to play good music. I I can't really do a bad song. Yeah. Bad songs are hard to remember. (laughs) They're hard to play in the studio because it like parts don't make sense. Yeah. I don't know. There's a lot of bad songs on the radio that I have a hard time getting in my head. There are also great bad songs. They're very professionally put together bad songs. (laughs) And those are those are fun to play. I like that. Sort of songs. Yeah. But uh, you know, I I don't. I only care about playing good music, and I don't care what instrument I'm playing, as long as I'm playing good music. Right, right. Maybe that goes back to just this understanding of, hey, when I play bass, it's just a different thing. Yeah, it's that same connection, but I'm still playing music, 
and if I'm doing what I want to do. But at the same time, you did mention if you get a chance to jump at playing bass, you're going to do it. Yeah. I mean, you know. it's a fun experience. It's scary right. because I can really make a terrible mistake. Like, <laughs> I've just played drums for so long that it's it's probably not going to, there's probably not going to be like a track ruining mistake. There yeah. is every now and then, but, you know, comparatively, comparatively to bass, the chances are much higher. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's exciting. And that's what's fun. Exciting. Like learning on music. That's how, that's how I like to learn. Yeah. I don't necessarily love honing in on an instrument and trying to get as fast or as clean or yeah. as as uh, independent with my limbs as I can. Mm-hmm. I'm more about learning what I can do within a song form. Yeah. Weird sounds, styles of playing, you know. Sure. Do you ever do do you ever do something in the studio where you're preparing drums or or uh, maybe as an, another example, uh, I know that you and Fred Eltringham played double drums uh, on some tracks with uh, Stony Larue. Yes. And uh, anything about that, um, we talked a bit about that, but um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about kind of that relationship with the other drummer when you're doing something like that. Well, the funny thing, was, of course, is the history that Fred and I have had sharing at least two gigs, if not three. Three Katie road Lang, gigs. Katie uh, Lang, records. the records. Um, I'm sure there's another one, but... Probably. Yeah, and uh, Eskimo Brothers of Eskimo drums. Brothers, yes. Okay. Uh, and we have very similar tastes. You know, we yeah. work in a similar genre, <laughs> and so it was a great match. Anyway, yeah, our pockets are different, um, okay. and they combine beautifully. I thought it was actually really interesting to to do that, and I feel like we we'd had pretty great conversations about who was going to do what. Mm-hmm. Like somebody would take the lead on one track, mm-hmm. somebody would do percussion. Uh, we'd combine to make the lead thing, uh, oh, cool. doing different things within a similar groove, or we would just play the same thing sometimes, just go full on, you know, double it. Uh, it was a really friction free time, and it it didn't take any longer than a regular record would have. That's cool. So, were, were you were you guys left to your own devices? I mean, did anyone say, "Hey, guys, yeah. we need to do this," or let them let them? Work? Frank Liddell was producing that record, and he's great because he gives direction by not telling you what to do. <laughs> he he just suggests ideas and yeah, and gives you examples and talks about it. Um, but otherwise, he's never really mm-hmm. telling you what to play, which I think the best producers do anyway. Right. Right. Um, so it's, the conversation was between us, and then the rest of the band would just fall in. That's awesome. And we've done it again on a on a demo session, actually. Yeah. And I hope it becomes more of a regular thing. Yeah, that sounds. I've never done it. That sounds like a blast. Yeah, it was great. There, was there uh, when one guy was playing? I guess, uh, as my buddy says, lead drums, uh, <laughs> and you were playing, say, more of a colorful part. Right. And was it more percussive? Were you using mallets? A lot of mallets with towels on the toms. Yeah. Um, a lot of bright percussion within the setup. Gotcha. Like goat's toes on the hi hat stand instead of hi hat cymbals and okay um, shaker yeah. with a stick taped to it hitting something. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that was great is I I play big drums usually. My main kit that I play in the studio is uh, 24, 14, 16, 18. Oh, cool. And he plays Ludwig standard sizes. Right. Uh, 12 or 13, 22 13, kick. 13, 16, yeah. Yeah, 22, 13, 16. 22, 13, 16. Yeah. So we could really, we could we didn't really compete tonally. Yeah. And there was a lot you could do with that. Yeah. But I think it's interesting when you, you talk about, like, tonally, when you're providing something percussive, outside the range, bright percussion. Right. Muted sounds, uh, towels, mallets, different things. Um whether it's the uh, the note itself or the tone of the note, just to provide something different, so you can hear. There's if you're going to take the time to record two drummers, it should sound like it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> when did you move back to Nashville? 2012 during the tour, okay. and uh, I the next year I immediately jumped on the road with Emmy Lou and Rodney. Man, I'd love to talk about that. Um, those guys, I mean. There's such icons and just kind of what that experience was like, how that came about. Um, you know, uh, well, the the roundabout long story, 
Rodney Crowell. Is this uh, a Bill Bruford reference? No. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, my grandfather actually signed Rodney Crowell to his first publishing deal when he moved to Nashville. Mm-hmm. Uh, he got duped into into coming here. There was a clause. My yeah. future grandson must. <laughs> right. <laughs> but he got duped into coming here because this this like crazy guy had produced a record on him and his pal Donovan for a hundred bucks. Signed, and he said, I got you a contract with Sony Records. You're going on the road with Kenny Rogers in the first edition. Mm-hmm. So he came to town. None of that was true. Uh, the guy had sold what his recordings to a, a publisher for like 100 bucks, And so he just kind of was like wasting away here in Nashville. Got a bar gig. And my grandfather's partner walked up to him after the bar gig um, when he played one of, the, one of his originals and said, Hey, we're cutting tomorrow. I would like to sign you and cut one of your songs. And so his first cut was You Can't Keep Me Here in Tennessee on Lord Mr. Ford by my grandfather. Wow. And he had no idea about this when I came up for the gig. Mm -hmm. Um, I got recommended by a a friend, and my name had just been around town. Um, So he called me to just show up and play for what ended up being an audition, but they didn't tell me to learn any songs. Mm. They just threw stuff at me and asked me to fall in. Sure. Sure. Which is an amazing way to audition, by the way. I I say most gigs should do that. You really figure out who somebody is. Yes. And um, I got the gig, and the band was me, Jed Hughes, Byron House, and Chris Tuttle. And this amazing glue happened where the band just became like basically the penultimate country rock bar band, with you know the added space folk. Yeah, that Emmy and Rodney can bring sometimes, yeah. and they just let you be you, and they're just wonderful, sweet people. Yeah, I feel like family with them. Like I just call them and talk to them for no good reason. That's awesome. At this point, um, and it was a great year with with Emmy Lou and Rodney that paved the way for a year of just playing with Emmy Lou solo. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, doing more of that was much more of a folky, mm-hmm. low key gig. Um. And we all ended up on the new record that came out yesterday, actually, May 12th. Wow. So, well, do you know what the name of the record is? Traveling Kind. Traveling Kind. Mm-hmm. Okay. Rodney Crow, I'm Lou Harris. Yeah. Traveling gotcha. I'm really proud of it. We all did it in one room, no headphones. So I played really quiet, minimalist on a lot of it. Okay. And uh, Joe Henry produced it. Okay. But, yeah, you know, I, I learned a lot with them, and I became really confident in my playing on that gig. How so? I mean, what do you mean by that? They just trust your intuition. They they barely tell you anything at all. But after working with original projects, I mean, you have to have a certain amount of confidence to like, this is me. This is what we're doing. You felt yeah. like there was something missing to that, or or you just or you can never have enough confidence. <laughs> I think it helps. You know, we're we're all real anxiety ridden, insecure messes at the end of the day. Good point. And you know, we're we have other people's dreams in our hands as hired musicians. Yeah. Which is pretty heavy. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. But at the same time, don't you think that letting someone else steer the ship and just being the side guy is just kind of, it's a safer way of not, I mean, I'm not saying it's safe uh, from a business standpoint, but um, at least when there's a bad review or a bad gig, you're like, well, it's not me. Yeah. You know, um, I guess that's why I was surprised to hear you say that uh, as far as a confidence booster. I understand what you mean now, but uh, the original projects that you've done, just staying kind of true to form, yeah, um, has always been kind of your, uh, or it just seems to be your M.O. Well, in general. Well, you know, the, the playing with Emmylou and Rodney kind of... Uh, I'm wondering what about that, that experience, those two artists, yeah, working with them. I mean, I, I can guess, but if you could kind of explain, what is it about that that, like, that gives you that extra boost of confidence? Um, well, they're, they're very profound human beings. They've done, they've done a lot of self-improvement and are always looking to be better and healthier and contribute to the world. They do a lot of charity, and they don't write songs that aren't about stuff. Mm. Yeah, they don't have you know beer drinking party songs. Rodney has a That's song. Stuff. Though. Yeah, <laughs> Rodney. Rodney has uh, a song about you know giving up to your higher power. Like say you're in recovery. The whole concept is if if Hank had made it out alive, 
mm. and you know beat his demons that just pleasing you um so that kind of human grounding with that material mm-hmm. makes what you're doing really important and i'd been on on road gigs where i'd played great songs before but uh i you know that kind of profound connection to the human condition when yeah. playing music was really kind of startlingly touching and important for you know kind of gaining perspective right and um it really kind of grounds you and to gain the approval of those kinds of people. Yeah. Because they're true greats. They yeah. really are true greats. It is profound. It means a lot. Yeah. It, it would boost anyone's confidence. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I also with the roster of drummers that have played with Emmy Lou mm-hmm. and even Rodney, like Larry London mm-hmm. and all those, all those people back in the day, Jim Keltner, um, that would be daunting. I would, I would think for most people, I was like, I'm playing with legends. It's great. And they became family. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I consider them family and they liked the way I played their songs. Yeah. So much so that they had me on one of their records. That's great, man. So yeah, that was a big confidence booster. Yeah. Um, in a way that playing a song about, you know, drinking whiskey till three in the morning would not be so much. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Actually there is. Jim. There's a lot wrong with that, but you know, <laughs> I was just trying to be nice. Uh, so, yeah, well, I'm I'm gonna go. Does I'm, that make sense? It does, and I'm going after that record. Yeah, I want to go check it out Please for do. sure, man. Yeah, I don't have enough Emily Lou stuff, and I don't have enough Rodney Crowell stuff. But um, I yeah, should. Houston Kid and uh, uh, Fate's Right Hand. It's funny, like his his late period stuff. Those two records, they're pretty heavy yeah. songs. Yeah, and we all know which ones of Emily Lou's were great. Yeah, yeah. But after that, you finish that gig, right? But for now, I'll probably play them again someday. I'm okay. sure. I would hope so. Are they just off tour? They're, oh, they're, they're not as a duo. They're, they're, they're touring now. to promote this record right now. They're with a. I see. With half about half the same band. Okay. Yeah. How did that come about? Where you were just like, I'm I'm going to do this, or they're going to say, Okay, we're going to we're going to get some different players. And- oh, I it was going to be the same band, but I I called Rodney in in uh, February, or so and said, Hey, man, I've got my own project, and yeah. I want to just stay home and play on session stuff whenever I'm not doing that. So yeah. I'm not going to be able to do the tour this year. Yeah. And he took it really well. Yeah. They decided to kind of reapproach things since it wasn't going to be, they were very attached to us as a band. And well, that's it nice. seems like, yeah. So it was, it was hard to leave. It was a hard decision. Yeah. But right. Well, man, I, again, I mean, that's, that's giving you more credit to your convictions as far as this is what I'm going to do. This is, I'm going to, spend my time and my energy into this original project and um, in a town that isn't necessarily friendly to this original, to original music. And, right. You know, that's great. Yeah. And, um, and your wife approves and she's in the band. Right. <laughs> I've got a good thing going. That's awesome. And it's actually, she writes all the songs, arranges them all really. I yeah. like come up with ideas like let's not, push there or let's yeah. only do that half as many times but otherwise she writes these iron maiden descendants who screw influenced songs bad religion songs yeah. yeah yeah so tell me the name of the band again friendship commanders friendship commanders okay friendship commanders band.com i was gonna say i thought there was a, th- a third thing i get the i get the invites out the friendship commanders that's right yeah Awesome, awesome. Was there anything about the gig when you were playing with uh, Emmy Lou and Rodney Crowd that changed when you were touring just with Emmy Lou? As far as your setup, I mean, as far um, as if, if we could talk. Oh, setup. Just as far as drums. Setup's uh, fun. Um, yeah. Just sizes, actually. Um, yeah. And I don't know that I wouldn't have used the bigger drums with Emmy Lou and Rodney, but. With Emmy Lou, I used a uh, 14 and 16 and a 26 maple kit with an 8x14 snare drum. Wow. Tuned high. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'd bounce the beater off the head rather than plant it. Nice. Um, whereas with Emmy Lou and Rodney, it was, I was rocking a 13, 16, 22 with a 7x14 snare. Okay. More deader, more like rock band. Right. Um, snare drums are using just the. Are using the Craviato wood mm-hmm. wood drums? 
Uh, I used a fourteen, uh, eight by fourteen brass a lot with Emmy Lou. Um, nice. My main deal was a seven by fourteen maple snare drum. Yeah. Um, sometimes an eight by fifteen birch that I have. Oh wow! Which is on a lot of the the new Emmy Lou and Rodney record. Okay, that's cool. Do you have that here? Uh, no, it's in my cartridge rig. Don't. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Um, what are you showing? What are you showing up with? I mean, you've got all these permutations of drums, uh, you know, with sessions and and demo, or is it does it just vary? Or you have your cartridge rig? What's in it? I've got three kits and cartridge and a big old snare case. Uh, the kit I talked about earlier, which is a Walnut Cherry Craviato 14, 16, 18, 24, mm-hmm. with a 12 that I haven't thrown in yet. I will maybe sometimes. Yeah. I just put the maple kit in there with the setup of 12 and 13 rack, 16 floor, 22 kick drum. Mm-hmm. And I have my coveted uh, Blue Oyster Pearl 1964 Ludwig kit. 22, 13, 16, yeah. um, that used to belong to Larry London and was on When Your Hot's Are Hot. Get out. And was in my grandfather's touring rig for a while. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and then just, uh, you say, a huge snare case and then slew yeah. of cymbals. Yeah. Yeah. I change cymbals out a lot, actually. I don't know. I don't, I'm sure a lot of other drummers do, but I change rides and hats a lot. I use different crashes for certain types of things. Mine will yeah. make so so many different symbols. How did that relationship come about? Uh, Chris Brewer, greatest A and R guy in the world, had just gotten hired at Minel, mm-hmm. and one of my friends, Maxwell Schaff, was working there. Yeah, and I just gotten the Gretchen gig. Yeah, so he signed me. Uh, I think one of his earlier um, artists. I've literally been there my whole adult life as okay. a Minel symbol artist. Yeah. We developed a good friendship, and you know, I went on to do stuff, and he saw something in me and stuck with me. Nice, yeah. And they've they're like the number two company now, almost. I think. I was going like. to say it seems like uh, only within the last decade or so have they been. And I, I'm kind of out of the retail, yeah, end of things these days. And a lot of that's attributed to Chris, man. I got to say, he really had a good vision on what modern day drummers. Is he in Nashville? The yeah, Nashville the company's here in Nashville. He's okay. from Knoxville originally. Okay. Um, but he had a really good vision on what artists would sell symbols and what artists are like were actually going to stick around and make mm-hmm. a mark. Like Bron Daler from Mastodon, he he got him signed on their, their first full length record. Wow. And he's so he's such a great drummer. But I, I remember him being one of the first big minor artists, like Chris Adler from Lamb of God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Man, that's yeah. amazing. That's really cool. We're really, we're both like completely whipped. (laughs) (laughs) Symbols, uh, drumstick weight circumference. (laughs) I know. Four ply versus three ply enforcement hoop dot dry head vented. Here's the thing you you come off of something that just like that stuff doesn't you you like gear though. I love gear, yeah, but you're not like, what is this? How am I gonna? But it's not to fix something, you're just like, I'm gonna play this shit. And I like this, and I like that. Yeah, I you know, opposed, you're coming at it from a different angle than how am I going to get my kick pedal to? How am I going to play faster? What kind of kick pedal do I need? You're just like, I'm going to use this. this it's going to get me the sound that I want. I like DW nine thousand pedals. Yeah. If I'm bouncing off the head, uh, I have the tension all the way. If I'm planting, I run it pretty loose. Yeah. Sometimes I forget to change that setting when I go on stage. And <laughs> I have a hard time for the first song. Yeah. Um, I play three different sizes of sticks that I've like settled on. Oh, really? Yeah. Man, talk about that. That's crazy. Uh, I don't think you... There's no one right way to make music. And as such, I think sticking with one thing is kind of weird sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, in my band, and when I'm in the studio playing loud stuff, yeah. I use X55As because I like the longer sticks. What brand is that? Vic Firth. Okay. Um, and I use Extreme 5As if I'm playing like a little quieter gig. Mm-hmm. But I use SD4 combos, I think they are. SD4 combos. They're made of maple and they've got ball tips. Oh, yeah. They're yeah. really light. Yes. They sound great on cymbals. Um, they're like concert snare sticks, aren't they? They're, they're, they're really light. They're like more for jazz and... Okay. But... 
uh, or they may be SD4 drivers, but yeah, they're made of maple, so they're light, mm-hmm. they're small, yeah, and they get a really great attack out of cymbals that yeah. really pokes out without having to hit it hard, mm-hmm. and they make the drums just a little crispier. Mm-hmm. They're great for playing quiet. So when I'm doing a vibier session with like one or two mics on the drum kit, yeah, or when I was doing Emmy Lou solo, I used those. Okay. That's they have cool. a much more retro feel and sound to them that you can't get out of any other drumstick. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. I mean, hickory being like the number one thing yeah, people are using, the, the and standard. then maybe oak being yeah. number two, maybe? Yeah, but I mean, you can't really like, I feel like you can't take five Bs and play a Roy Orbison song and make it sound legit. They weren't using those back then. Yeah. They are using small sticks. Right, right. Mm-hmm. I think what amazes me is um, the sound that players that I, I mean I just completely love the sound that they're getting out of the smaller sticks yeah as as this my sticks over the years have gotten bigger and bigger you know right to get this big sound um which is funnier because the smallest stick i play now is, is lighter than any the lightest stick i ever used before but i'm playing bigger sticks than ever for rock stuff yeah yeah so but I think what's important is that you're switching sticks the way someone would switch mallets. Right. You know. And I don't know why that isn't more common, but it makes sense to me. Yeah. I think maybe it just has to do with um, this is comfortable and I'm going to play this. Where you're like, whatever, it's all comfortable. It's getting the end result. Right. And what's getting, you know, you don't think about it when you pick up, if you're a mallet player, you know, you're going to use this or that. Um, or a timpani player, or I don't know. Um, I don't know how often guitar players switch out different things, uh, string picks. Yeah, I feel like yeah. there, there are different pick weights. Well, right. you know, a lot. Yeah. Like if you want like a more Bowie sound out of the string, out of the strings, or a more tacky uh, sound, brighter yeah. attack. Yeah. Uh, oh, David Bowie. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. The, the, like that. Yeah. Seventies right. David Bowie sound. By, by the way. There's this musicianship that exudes and this effortless in your playing. And I feel like um, I'm constantly trying to attain, uh, personally as a drummer myself, I'm trying to attain more of that musicianship in my playing because for so long I approached music from a drummer standpoint, you know, when I was young. Yeah. And then recognizing the value of um, understanding music from a broader perspective to make your drumming better, more musical. Yeah, and uh, playing a, a really great supporting and musical role as a as a drummer, and not being a drummer's drummer, but being a musician first. Right. Um, so it's a. I think it's going to be a struggle for the rest of my life um, to try and hear things from that perspective and perform that way. Um, so it's it's cool to watch the way you approach the drums, and I would say almost like this it's not a not caring kind of thing it's you're less concerned with what's going on physically and more just like we're just playing music man yeah you know um and i think uh the history that you have uh, growing up in the musical family and having instruments and sticks available that the physical part of it and the mental part of it have always been just this strong connection you know there's no there's no puzzle piece with that it's one yeah. solid piece it's been all there ever was for me yeah, yeah yeah so how do we attain that i don't know man any advice from somebody let me ask you what don't your... think about it ever that's cuz i don't yeah. i had to think about it when you asked me these questions and it's interesting you know what I mean? That, that's that's probably not helpful at all. But I mean, just turn off. No, and, seriously. But yeah. well, you're because I don't have the experience. I don't have the history that you have. Uh, as far as uh, growing up, I mean, I had music in the house. Yeah, and I grew up with some music in church and different things like that. But um, and your, I think your situation is unique. So among those that are like me that kind of want to smooth out that connection between music and playing drums and the physical and, and, and all these other things and, and, and all the noise about you have to play this and you have to do that. And that's, you know, that's exactly it. I would, I would separate the intellectual and all premeditated actions and thoughts mm-hmm. 
and just spiritually connect via good taste with the music. Yeah. Um, the the way you should do things, I'm, a very, I'm, a, I'm an enemy of that way of thought. There's definitely something to some of it mm-hmm. for the most part. Mm-hmm. But you should never put a you know microphone inside the kick drum, or like you should only ever use three mics. Like it doesn't that doesn't work for for you know all music. Three mics doesn't work on a on a punk rock record where you're doing really fast tom stuff. You need it to poke out. You know right. what I mean? It doesn't yeah. make sense. Yeah, you can't set it works hard for fast it. rules right. about things. It works for Dap stuff. King's record big time. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. But there's times that you're doing gigs that maybe it's it depends on what you do to make a living, and sometimes you're doing uh, covers that you that you're not maybe a huge fan of, yeah. and so the spiritual connection is going to be really hard to attain. And you know but you, you have, have to be have professional. To, you about have it. to do that stuff. Uh, I think it's good to avoid it as much as possible, um, even if you go broke, because it will make you better at playing the real music that's going to get you farther as a musician in your career. Mm-hmm. And it'll make you a better person because you won't be so bummed out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I get it. Yeah. For sure, man. Yeah. For sure. Bad, bad situations, bad music, bad stuff is just toxic. Yeah. It poisons your thoughts. It yeah. poisons your motives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've, I've made a pretty strong decision to distance myself from things I don't want to do and things I don't like and make my statement clear about it. Yeah. And if I still get calls for that stuff, then great. It means we're on the same page. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. 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 But I'm pretty happy to say it. these days I don't really do much that I don't enjoy. Maybe my attitude's just good and I find a way to enjoy things even if they're, you know, not necessarily the greatest in the world, but no, I think that statement is true. Yeah. I would say so, based on what you're telling me right now. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you found this place. I mean, you had you had three months there that, you know, you might not have gone down that path. I mean, you did something maybe didn't want to do for three months, but yeah. that was a, that, you know, you learned your lesson. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I'm friends with everybody else I've ever played with. It, like, I'm yeah. on good terms. Like, I can call them, and it's not weird. Michelle yeah, Branch. Sh- sure. Randy Hauser, I played for, with him for a stint when, on his okay. very, very first record. Awesome. Um, it's it's a good way to be. Right. Katie Lang sends me like texts making fun of me every now and then. Oh. It's great. She seems really cool. Yeah. She's awesome. Yeah. That was a weird, to, uh, to go back to one thing we said earlier, how, you know, when you're playing folk music, they're the timekeeper. For the most part, I was used to playing like that, and I kind of walked in on the KD gig, gig thinking it would be that way, mm-hmm. when it wasn't at all. Mm. And she really counted on the drummer to like push her forward. Wow! And it was surprising. Yeah. Because I, you know, wanted to approach that music with a different thing, with a more like downplayed, letting them be the star type of deal. But she really liked to be pushed by the drummer. Yeah. And uh, it freaked me out at first. So it was kind of the exact opposite of what the Amy Lou gig was, and they were both so great. Yeah. But, you know, it's just, again, there's no one right way to do everything. Right. And Katie Lang seems like there's songs that she has that kind of straddle that line between just popular, I mean, just less, I guess I wouldn't say pop, but less uh, folky. Yeah. Um, so it, that she has some straight up, rock songs in the set yeah. the way we played constant craving was almost like the cure it was really vibey like lots of toms oh cool and it got loud yeah um she had one sort of psychedelic number and one night she actually turned around to me and started throwing punches at, at me and said play motherfucker and it was great <laughs> she wanted me to like play out i got a drum solo on the katie lane gig i see <laughs> yeah very very whimsically one night she just turned around and pointed at me and I had to play drum solo, and it was really funny. <laughs> it was great. And how did it go over? Uh, it was. It went over very well. It was a very festive night. Nice. So that's awesome, man. Yeah, that's fun. That's fun. Jerry, thanks, man. Thank you. I appreciate you, man. Yeah, thanks for asking me to do it. Get Keep some, doing it, please. Get some sleep. You as well. 
Maybe. Have some nice food. So there you have it, Jerry Rowe. Uh, it was a great interview. We appreciate him taking the time to talk to me. Um, again, like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, you can find us on workingdrummer.net and on iTunes. And please, if you like what you hear, go to iTunes and write a review. Uh, it's uh, We really appreciate it. Um, but thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>